Hey everybody, Rob Mauer here, and today we're talking about the potential impact of new regulatory credits that Tesla has reportedly applied for. We also have tweets from Elon Musk on the status of autopilot and full self-driving, an update on Giga Berlin, news from Waymo, Cruise, and Toyota, and we'll start by revisiting the China April sales numbers that we discussed yesterday. Rough day in the markets today, pretty much across the board, Tesla finishing down 4.4% to $589.89. That compared to the Nasdaq down 2.7%, ARK's Innovation ETF down 3.7%, so Tesla faring a little bit worse, but certainly not an outlier in terms of the performance today. All right, I want to start off by revisiting China April sales. So of course, we talked about this yesterday, some of the confusion out there. I went into a lot of detail on that so that people could understand where the various different viewpoints were coming from and why there was so much confusion and uncertainty yesterday. Today, I think we've got much more certainty. So we'll get through this quicker today. First, I did want to note a correction. So the confusion was about whether April sales numbers included or excluded exports. One of the main factors for me leaning toward it being exclusive of exports, and therefore a higher total number, was the export number for SAC passenger vehicles being higher than the wholesale sales numbers. But unfortunately, a commenter pointed out to me that that was based on a mistranslation. So the wholesale sales figure for SAC passenger vehicles was actually 13,004 rather than 1,304, so unfortunately that didn't give us any more information about how Tesla's sales compared to exports. So apologies for that. Whenever I do find errors like that, I tweet them out at Tesla Podcast, so good reason to follow on Twitter and turn notifications on there. I try to limit my tweets so that the notifications are actually useful, I'm not spamming you. And then I also make sure to pin a comment on that video as well as provide an update in the next video, which I'm doing now. Anyway, as I said yesterday, related to those April sales figures, we should be getting more information over the coming days, and we've now started to see from a couple different sources insurance data on individual models come out for April. So we can see here, it looks like about 6,400 for the Model 3, 5,500 for the Model Y in China in April. So right around 12,000 newly insured Tesla vehicles in China in April. D. Kirk on Twitter, who also tracks these things closely, has posted similar numbers. With that information, I think we can now be pretty highly confident that the CPCA wholesale sales data of about 25,800 vehicles for Tesla in April is inclusive of the roughly 14,000 exported vehicles. So it's not entirely clear why, but it does look like the CPCA changed how they reported on this for April. And it now looks highly likely that the 42 How report, which said that they confirmed with the CPCA and Tesla China that the export number was included in the wholesale number, was accurate. And remember, they also reported that there was a two-week production line shutdown for the Model Y in early April. So I think many people, including myself, were surprised by that report because we hadn't really heard anything about it. A commenter did note that from watching the drone videos from Wuwa, who does basically daily drone videos at Shanghai, that the report of that shutdown did make sense. Maybe that's just with the benefit of hindsight, who knows? But the point is that now looks likely. So we've got 14,000 exports, somewhere around 12,000 vehicles sold and registered in China in April. As I said yesterday, it's not necessarily fair to group those up and assume that production was 26,000, just like it's not necessarily fair to assume that March's production was 35,000. Sometimes there are delivery lags, especially in the first month of the quarter. You're just naturally going to prioritize deliveries at that point that take longer to complete so that you can deliver more in that quarter. So if the number had been around 40,000, that would have been an indicator of a really strong and surprising positive. Now that we're looking at 14,000 exports and 12,000 domestic sales, yeah, it's not a great number, but if there's a production shutdown in there that probably took away maybe 5,000 units of Model Y production, then a number around 30,000 would have been right in line with expectations and would have been the best first month of the quarter in China so far. So certainly not a number I'm worried about. I think we'll see a couple of great months here in May and June in China. And remember, just to wrap it up, the only reason we really talk about these month-to-month -month sales is to try to get a feel for how production is ramping, because with eight days of global inventory at the end of Q1, it is extremely clear to anyone that wants to pay attention that Tesla is supply constrained. All right, next up here, we have a really interesting report from Reuters about Tesla seeking entry into the U.S. renewable fuel credit market, not a market that I know a ton about, so I've spent quite a bit of time researching this today. First, with the report, Reuters writes that Tesla is, quote, seeking to enter the multi-billion dollar U.S. renewable credit market, hoping to profit from the Biden administration's march toward new zero emission goals, two sources familiar with the matter said, end quote. Reuters says that Tesla is one of at least eight companies with a pending application to the EPA to join this market, which they say was an $18 billion market in 2020. Reuters says that the Biden administration is expected to review these applications and lay out how EVs could qualify for credits this summer, again citing those two sources. So I found this article to be a little bit confusing because it keeps bringing up biogas. For example, it says, quote, 
Tesla's application would likely be tied to the production of electricity associated with biogas, end quote, which I find confusing because as far as I know, Tesla's not really doing anything in that space, production of electricity associated with biogas. Maybe there's a solar or storage project out there tied to a biogas producer. But even then, I think that producer would actually then be generating the credits off the sale of that biofuel. So I don't even see how Tesla would be involved in that way. So it's very possible there's something that I'm not understanding there, but I think they're just talking about biogas because the structure of this credit system really centers around biofuels. So the way this works is that when a fuel, which is designated as renewable to some extent, is created, and it can be demonstrated that that fuel is going to be used for transportation, it generates an RIN, a renewable identification number, that is used as a credit, which is tradable, and acts as a currency for the Renewable Fuel Standard Program. Depending on the type of fuel, those renewable identification numbers, or RINs, fall into one of five categories, D3 through D7. Those credits have varying degrees of value. The breakdown's not super important for us, but Reuters here does say that Tesla would generate the most lucrative credits being D3. Looking at the ridiculously long structure here on the government's website, that does look to me to be the case. They've got a table here breaking down a bunch of different fuel types and their corresponding D codes. And again, these are mostly gas-based, but in section Q, they do list renewable electricity and the corresponding D code three. So from that section, it looks like generation of renewable electricity counts as a renewable fuel under this credit system. There are a couple other sections that talk about qualifications. One here says that non-qualifying fuel means use of a renewable fuel in an application other than transportation fuel, heating oil, or jet fuel. Then it goes on to say renewable electricity means electricity that meets the definition of a renewable fuel i.e. used as transportation fuel is my take on it, but then it goes on to say that renewable fuel means a fuel that meets all the requirements, one of which is that it's produced from renewable biomass. So it's a little bit confusing exactly what is required here. Maybe that's what the Biden administration has to look at, but I think my takeaway is that renewable electricity would count as a renewable fuel in this scenario, which duh, but again, it's primarily gas-based, but you also have to demonstrate that the generation of that renewable electricity is linked to fueling transport. That seems to be quite a gray area because if Tesla has a solar panel, let's say on top of a supercharger station and all that energy is going into the superchargers then into vehicles, that seems like a clear link. But what about a solar panel on top of a customer's house that's charging their electric vehicle? What if that's under the solar city model where Tesla's actually selling the electricity to the customer rather than the customer owning that solar panel? Would Tesla earn credits on that? What if Tesla is buying renewable energy for their superchargers and then powering all their vehicles that are supercharging with renewable energy that they purchased? Does that count for a credit? These things are still unclear to me, and I have emailed the EPA, actually three different accounts there, to try to get some clarity on that situation. But let's say that Tesla does get approved, they start generating some of these credits. How much are these credits actually then worth? Well, one of the sections on the government website says that 22.6 kilowatt hours of electricity shall represent one gallon of renewable fuel with an equivalence value of 1.0. Again, coming back to types, that would be a D3 credit. So these credits trade on a marketplace. You can see that marketplace on the EPA's website. And here's the price of those credits for the last five years. You can see the top line here is in blue. That's the D3 credit line. And those have generally traded in a range of 75 cents to $3 per credit. Last trades have been at about $2.30 per credit. That actually makes the math super easy because again, 22.6 kilowatt hours is one credit. So that breaks down to about 10 cents per kilowatt hour. So we do actually know Tesla's annual energy production from their 2019 impact report that came out last June. Side note, maybe we'll see another one of those for 2020 next month. But they show here cumulative energy generation from Tesla solar panels each year. So we can see that from 2018 to 2019, that was about an additional 5,000 gigawatt hours. And that number will increase over time as Tesla installs more solar. So for 2021, let's just say somewhere between 5,000 gigawatt hours and 10,000 gigawatt hours generated on the year. So 5 to 10 billion kilowatt hours. So just to establish a ceiling here, if Tesla were able to earn an RIN credit on every single kilowatt hour there, that would be 500 million to a billion dollars in credits per year. Now it's important to understand that is a ceiling. Tesla doesn't actually own all of this solar that they're referring to here, and not all of it is going to go to transportation. I'd have to guess that in terms of what Tesla owns that they can prove is going directly to transportation, it's probably a pretty small fraction of that. Hopefully any response to my emails to the EPA would give us a little bit more clarity on that, but I'd have to guess, you know, I don't know, 10% or so. So maybe it's only 50 million to 100 million per year on these credits if Tesla is approved. 
So I know that's a bit anticlimactic, but I did want to share that. I did do a lot of research on that, and I think it helps us understand how impactful or not impactful this news is. And while 50 to $100 million might not be huge for Tesla right now, this could potentially grow if Tesla does install a lot more solar in future years that they own for things like superchargers, mega chargers, if the semi comes online. There's potential for this to grow as Tesla grows, and I think maybe most importantly, would provide a good incentive for Tesla, if my understanding is correct on how this works, to install more solar on supercharger sites. While that may not be super beneficial to the financials early on, that can provide clean energy for Tesla vehicles and financial benefits for years and years after installation. So if anyone has any more knowledge on that space, how those credits work, let me know. Otherwise, we'll wait and see if we hear anything back from the EPA. I'll definitely update on that. Hopefully the thoroughness there didn't bore anyone too much. Let's move on, though. We do still have quite a few other topics here to discuss. First up is Bitcoin. Elon tweeting this out as I'm recording today, announcing that Tesla has suspended accepting Bitcoin as a purchase option for Tesla vehicles, saying, quote, we are concerned about rapidly increasing use of fossil fuels for Bitcoin mining and transactions, especially coal, which has the worst emissions of any fuel. Cryptocurrency is a good idea on many levels, and we believe it has a promising future, but this cannot come at a great cost to the environment. Tesla will not be selling any Bitcoin, and we intend to use it for transactions as soon as mining transitions to more sustainable energy. We are also looking at other cryptocurrencies that use less than 1% of Bitcoin's energy per transaction." End quote. So there is the I told you so moment for a lot of people that have been critical of Tesla's purchase of Bitcoin for environmental reasons. Certainly not a great look for Tesla to backtrack on their decision only a couple months now after purchasing Bitcoin, because the implication here is that they did not do their due diligence on the environmental impact before they actually ended up purchasing and accepting Bitcoin as a transaction option. So I've been fairly positive about the purchase of Bitcoin. I think it's represented forward thinkingness from Tesla, and I like that they're willing to be more aggressive in some of those spaces. The environmental impact and the criticisms there is something that I have brought up, and unfortunately we just never spent the time to go into detail on that topic. Probably a missed opportunity there. I do think it's a little bit more complex than people make it sound sometimes, but certainly there are less energy intensive ways of conducting transactions, and it sounds like that is what Tesla is going to be looking at now from a cryptocurrency perspective. What that ends up meaning, who knows, maybe Tesla's looking more at Ethereum, maybe Cardano. Yesterday, of course, Elon tweeting about if people want Tesla to accept Dogecoin, and more than 3 million of the 4 million responses said yes. So yeah, Dogecoin is a joke, but it's also the recently fourth, now fifth most valuable cryptocurrency. At what point does it become not just a joke? And it seems like we probably already surpassed that point. Maybe this also stokes Tesla's interest in developing their own cryptocurrency, or maybe they just did this all along to point out the problems with Bitcoin, giving them an excuse to make their own cryptocurrency. Probably not, but hey, you never know. Just to be clear, mostly joking about that, not trying to be a Tesla apologist and say that, oh, they were going to do this all along. Anyway, we did get a few more tweets from Elon about Autopilot last night. In response to Gary Black asking about version 9 beta expansion, subscription launch, Elon says, quote, We had to focus on removing radar and confirming safety. That release goes out next week to US production, then a week or two to polish Pure Vision FSD, and version 9 beta will release. Difference between V8 and V9 is gigantic, end quote. So kind of confusing on the timing here, saying that release goes out next week to US production, but then a week or two to polish Pure Vision and FSD beta will release. Elon in another tweet also responding to someone asking about the V9 beta, saying, quote, I think we're maybe a month or two away from wide beta, but these things are hard to predict accurately, end quote. So we've got next week, then a week or two after that for another release, and then maybe a month to two months for yet another release. My take on this is that they're removing radar from the entire autopilot suite next week for the US fleet, then another week or two for the FSD version 9 beta limited release, so to the beta customers right now, then a wide beta in a month or two, which obviously people are going to groan at that, perhaps justifiably so, because two weeks ago, Elon said we might see a release of version 9 beta in two weeks. But it is worth noting, as I noted at the time, that was in response to a question about a limited rollout of version 9. So that would be, in my view, just to the beta testers, not to everyone. Whereas wide beta here could mean everyone in the US with FSD, but it could also just mean another 10x, which was once mentioned for the limited beta program. So we'll wait and see. As usual, I wouldn't put a ton of stock in that timeline there. He does say that subscriptions could roll out in a month for FSD, and also notes that eliminating radar should eliminate phantom braking issues as well. Next up here is a really quick update on Giga Berlin. This is just again from Brandenburg's Minister of Economic Affairs, Jörg Steinbach. 
per Der Tagesspiegel at an economic committee meeting today, Jörg Steinbach again said that he does expect production for Tesla in late summer or autumn. So this isn't news because we heard Jörg Steinbach say this a couple weeks back. Remember, Tesla Rati reported on this around the time of rumors of a six-month delay leading to production at end of January next year, but did just want to at least pass that along as Steinbach has now held that stance for the last week and a half. All right, last couple of stories here. We've got self-driving service updates from both Waymo and Cruise, which have filed permits with San Francisco to start ride and delivery services using autonomous vehicles. The California DMV is still reviewing their applications. Waymo would intend to start with driver operations with Cruise with no driver right from the start, though Cruise does say that they would limit their operations to under 30 miles per hour and their service hours would be late evening to early morning, whereas Waymo says that they would go up to speed limits of 65 miles per hour and operate throughout the entire day. In other Waymo news, following the departure of CEO John Krafchick, which we have already discussed, Waymo is now losing their chief financial officer and head of automotive partnerships, according to a report from TechCrunch, so a lot of shuffling there at the top for Waymo this year. All right, lastly here is a pretty shocking update from Toyota. Well, I guess shocking depending on your perspective. Toyota discussed their electrified vehicle strategy by 2030, they said they expect to sell about 8 million electrified vehicles globally by 2030. Now, I'm pretty sure they mean annually there, not cumulatively, so 8 million in 2030. But that is electrified vehicles. That includes hybrids. They only expect 2 million of those to be actual battery electric vehicles or fuel cell vehicles. This is the biggest automaker in the world alongside Volkswagen, and they're only targeting less than 2 million battery electric vehicles in 2030. Obviously, Tesla's got a lofty target, but Tesla's targeting 10 times that amount. So no wonder we reported earlier this week that investors in Toyota were questioning if they really understand what's going on here. My opinion, they definitely do not. So long episode, but that is where we'll leave it for today. As always, thank you for listening. Make sure you're subscribed and signed up for notifications. You can also find me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast, and I'll see you tomorrow for the Thursday, May 13th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.